Welcome to the second episode of Elliott Wave Reveal. I'm Jeff Hughes, Chief Investment Officer at JWH Investment Partners and the founder of Alpha Insights, a subscription-based institutional investment strategy publication. This is an educational series designed to help viewers understand a time-tested approach to market analysis that dates back to the 1930s, known as Elliott Wave Principle. I've been studying the discipline for over 25 years, and I hope to help uh, you understand what I've learned on my journey over that period of time. Our goal over the next 30 minutes or so is to help build the foundation of basic knowledge on the uh, subject of the Elliott Wave Principle, looking back at the history and the theory behind the discipline. We hope that at the end of this presentation, our viewers will have a basic grasp of the general nomenclature and terminology associated with the theory and how it's applied to market analysis. Uh, this is the second in a monthly series on the subject of Elliott Wave Principle. In future episodes, we plan to dive much deeper into Elliott's rules and guidelines uh, for wave formation and the nuances of correctly identifying these patterns. And uh, at the end of this episode, we're going to go through a detailed analysis of current market conditions. So with that, let's begin by just reviewing quickly uh, what we did last week or last uh, episode, uh, where we went through the history and the theory of the Elliott Wave principle and the basic framework. We also got through a detailed discussion on motive waves. However, we did not get to corrective waves due to uh, time considerations. And so uh, we're going to endeavor to dig deeper into corrective waves. But before we do that, I do want to quickly review motive waves. However, uh, we're going to jump into a shameless commercial first, just to make sure that you're aware of our monthly investment newsletter. Uh, we've been publishing an investment newsletter now for over two years. Uh, it's free to subscribe on Substack, and it's delivered directly to your email address uh, on uh, the first Saturday of each month following the non-farm payroll report. The newsletter is affectionately titled Huge Insights, the Big Picture, and therein we discuss the key macro factors and the events in the market that are driving uh, you know, the economy and the markets. We also dig into some geopolitical considerations. Uh, we get a lot of feedback from uh, subscribers that they very much appreciate our analysis, but they want more information. They want to understand how to apply it to current market conditions and you know, they want some idea flow. And so for those who want a little bit more, there's also an option to upgrade to paid for as little as $12 a month. And that includes our monthly market forecast and positioning recommendations. Paid subscribers also receive our weekly Alpha Insights Idea Generator Lab publication, an institutional publication, which details our top actionable trade idea each week and provides updated market commentary and sector rotation analysis that's delivered every Every Wednesday afternoon. So, in order to get onto our, uh, 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 our our distribution list, you just need to go to hugeinsights.substack.com and type in your email and press subscribe, and you will be uh, receiving our uh, newsletter on the first Saturday of each month. With that said, let's jump into a quick review of motive waves. So. Just to kind of review the basic framework, prices have just two wave modes. There's motive wave and there's a corrective waveform. Now the motive wave defines the direction of the trend for prices and it unfolds as five waves. The corrective wave is a counter trend interruption that allows supply and demand to rebalance and that always unfolds as three waves. Now, progress takes on a very specific five-wave form uh, of the motive wave. Three of these waves, waves one, three, and five, affect the directional movement, and they themselves are motive waves at a lower degree of trend. They are separated by two counter-trend interruptions, waves two and four, which themselves are also corrective waves at a lower degree of trend. The pattern is fractal in its nature and recurring at every degree of trend. Motive waves do not always point upwards and corrective waves don't always point downward. The mode of a wave is always considered within the context of its relationship to the wave structure at one larger degree of trend. Motive waves uh, really define 
the direction of the market. There are only two forms of motive waves. There's the impulse and the diagonal. The impulse is the most common of the two, and uh, it always unfolds in five waves, in a specific 5-3, five, 5-3, three, five, three, five pattern. That makes it very easily identifiable. Uh, there are also some nuances. For example, uh, wave one within a motive wave cannot, uh, uh, or wave four rather, cannot enter into the territory of wave one. So that is one way to really identify the motive wave and differentiate it from any other wave because there's no overlap between waves four and wave one. The diagonal can take on a form of a leading diagonal or uh, in, in wave one or an ending diagonal in wave five. Uh, the leading diagonal unfolds is five waves, but it can also uh, take on either a five, three, five, three, five form or a three, 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 three pattern. Now, wave one is usually the longest in a leading diagonal. The ending diagonal also unfolds as five waves, but always traces out a three, 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 three pattern. Both varieties can take on either a converging or expanding wedge-like shape, making it fairly easy to identify at smaller degrees of trend, but highly difficult to identify at very large degrees of trend, just because the amount of time it takes for it to unfold. Now, the leading diagonal form is primarily observed at the start of declines. The leading diagonal form actually was not part of Eliot's original work. It was later discovered and documented by A.J. Frost and Robert Prechter in their seminal uh, book, Elliott Wave Principle, uh, published back in 1978. And most of the diagrams that we're using in this uh, presentation uh, come from that text to give you some perspective. So uh, looking at the diagrams, you can see that there are a variety of different, uh, both bullish and bearish uh, impulse wave patterns. Those, those wave forms um, basically um, uh, are punctuated by what's known as an extension, okay? Oftentimes the extension comes in the third wave. That is most common, but there's periods of time where it can come in the first wave or in the fifth wave. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, especially at small degrees of trend, it's difficult to really identify which, uh, you know, which subdivision is actually extending. And so what we're really looking for is a series of nine waves to define an impulse, as long as none of those waves overlap. So um, with that, let's take a quick, uh, let's get a more detailed look at uh, corrective waveforms. Now, corrective waves, as I mentioned before, are the counter trend interruption between uh, impulse waves or motive waves. And the corrective wave uh, form tends to be uh, somewhat more complex than the traditional motive wave, especially the impulse, which is very easy to identify. Corrective waveforms, on the other hand, come in 11 different forms, plus combinations of these forms, uh, including zigzags, flats, and triangles, which usually unfold in three waves in a 5-3-5 five, three, five pattern or a 3-3-3 three, three, three pattern, but also sometimes unfold as a three, three, five pattern. And uh, in the case of triangles, they always unfold as a series of threes, usually in five um, waves. So you'll get a three, 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 three pattern. And triangles are very specific because uh, they are lateral consolidation forms. Uh, they tend to take on uh, a very easily identifiable sort of coiling uh, process. Uh, there are really four different varieties of triangles. There's the ascending triangle and the descending triangle. There's also the symmetrical triangle. And then there's the expanding or reverse symmetrical triangle. Uh, all of those are detailed in the uh, chart to the left here. And um, it's interesting that, you know, many of these corrective waveforms make up the broad catalog of patterns that chartists have nicknamed over the years, such as pennants, flags, triangles, head and shoulders, and cup and handles, etc. cetera. Um, they are really um, Elliott waveforms that are a function of behavioral finance. 
And so uh, they are really somewhat more difficult to identify uh, and they take a great deal of patience and perseverance in order to arrive at the correct conclusion, uh, which oftentimes is you know, only fully understood in hindsight. And that's why we have these nicknames because you know, over the years, you know, chartists have been looking at these patterns and once they're able to kind of see a specific shape, they wanna be able to you know, holler out like, it's a flag or it's a head and shoulders. Um, you know, it's obvious that that's what it is at this point. And so, you know, it really is very obvious and understood in hindsight. Uh, but, you know, within the whole process of identifying the corrective waveform to, to come to the right conclusion, uh, it's, it's just a process of elimination. In fact, it's long been considered the best practice of technicians who do employ Elliott wave analysis to develop and rank several alternate counts in order to establish a, a path to success through the process of elimination. Now, let's just go through some of these corrective counts. We mentioned zigzag, which is the most common. And, and as you know, you know a, th a zigzag is three waves, an A, B, C pattern, but there are subdivisions. And since the pattern can unfold as a five, three, five, typically, uh, we'll see a motive wave defining that change in trend. So in other words, if the advance is a motive wave, uh, the correction will be led by a motive wave in the opposite direction, which will ultimately unfold as wave A of an ABC to complete that corrective pattern. Sometimes zigzag patterns can morph into what's known as a double zigzag. That's two ABC patterns uh, bifurcated by another ABC pattern. And when we see that, we label it slightly different. Uh, we label the first zigzag as wave W, the second zigzag is an X wave, and the third zigzag is wave Y. Now it's possible to also see uh, these morph into a triple zigzag. That's the uh, most complex zigzag that's ever been uh, cataloged. And what follows wave Y is another X wave. And that unfolds again as a, a separate ABC, which is then followed by another ABC pattern that's labeled wave Z. Now, um, what differentiates an impulse wave from a triple zigzag is the fact that wave four of an impulse cannot enter into the territory of wave one. But oftentimes a triple zigzag will be very lateral and overlapping, whereby uh, the final or the third zigzag will actually see an overlap with the first zigzag, indicating that it's a corrective waveform and not an impulse pattern. Another common um, uh, corrective waveform is what's known as a flat. And this is another type of lateral um, uh, consolidation pattern, whereby waves A and B unfold as three waves, but waves C uh, typically unfolds in five waves. And when we see a pattern of that nature, um, it's often going to show up in the fourth wave position, which is generally a position where, um, you know, through uh, uh, the, the science of behavioral economics or behavioral finance, uh, you know, investors, because they're, they're you know, kind of concerned as to whether this is the end of a corrective form or the beginning of an impulse form, they tend to take a wait and see attitude. And that results in a lateral consolidation pattern. Oftentimes flats and triangles make up that fourth wave position. Another possibility is a combination where we see really any three, uh, uh, you know, different forms kind of meld together. In the case of this particular example, uh, you see a flat melded with a zigzag and a triangle to complete uh, a very complex corrective waveform that ultimately, uh, you know, analysts will have to go through many iterations, many alternate counts in order to determine what's going on. And in fact, uh, it, it takes a lot of patience. And so again, just to reiterate, you know, successful Elliotticians, those who, you know, utilize the Elliott wave principle in their analysis will develop and rank uh, a number of alternate counts in order to establish that path to success through the process of elimination. So we'll get more into uh, the rules and guidelines around these corrective waveforms as we do some live 
uh, analysis. So uh, with the next slide, what I'd like to do is kind of take you to the current market condition. And as you can see in the chart, we've basically taken uh, the August 14th midday uh, weekly chart, looking back uh, all a little over three years uh, to the, um, the March 2020 lows, which we marked as a primary wave four of cycle wave five. And we, we basically um, identified the breakout above the prior wave B high as being a final leg to cycle wave five. In other words, primary wave five up of cycle wave five up to complete super cycle wave three. Now that's a lot to think about. And what we really wanna do is focus on the corrective waveform that's in progress right now. But in order to do so, we need to understand where we're coming from. So, you know, we think based on our analysis of the entirety of the stock market's, um, uh, you know, history um, as, a, as being publicly traded um, and, and the data that's at hand going back to the late 1800s, we conclude that uh, the top that we saw in uh, January of 2022 was probably very likely the end of a super cycle advance that we began back in 1932, a 90-year cycle advance. And that peak uh, you know, ended with a pretty aggressive decline. And that decline uh, ultimately ended in October and uh, has been reversed to a large extent. In fact, we've retraced some 84% of that. But uh, as the inset chart suggests, the decline in the S&P 500 off the January 4th, 2022 intraday high appears to have traced out a leading expanding diagonal waveform at primary degree of trend. And illustrated at left, we've actually counted five waves down at any intermediate degree of trend to complete that primary wave one decline of cycle wave A down. And you know it's part of an ever larger degree corrective waveform uh, with potential super cycle proportions, uh, which we'll get to later. Uh, but off the primary one low, which terminated October 13th, a counter trend advance has developed to form a zigzag corrective waveform, which we label ABC in capital letters, which once terminated will complete primary wave two up of cycle wave A down, which we believe will trace out five waves uh, at primary degree of trend. So primary wave two appears to be a textbook example of the way a corrective waveform can begin to really take on a life of its own. The initial advance into the February 2nd high appeared to complete primary wave two and could have accurately been counted as a zigzag, yet the subsequent decline into the March 13th low fell short of the December 19th, 2022 low, leaving open the possibility of a more complex corrective waveform developing. Now, the penetration above the February 2nd high confirmed that the lateral consolidation pattern that had developed between the December high and the March low was actually a flat corrective waveform, which we've labeled ABC in parentheses. Um, that that flat corrective waveform completed intermediate wave B of primary wave two up. And we've labeled that with a capital B. Now from the March low through the July 27th high of this year, we can observe that price has traced out a clear impulse pattern of five waves at minor degree. And we've labeled that uh, in uh, uh, lower case, um, uh, Roman numerals one through five to complete intermediate wave C of primary wave two. If this analysis is correct, then we are on the precipice of a third wave decline at primary degree of trend, which should carry the S&P 500 down to new bear market lows. Let's take a more in-depth look at this entire um, history or market history going back to that January 2022 high on January 4th. So what we're looking at right now is a daily range chart 
going back to uh, the beginning of that downtrend, which again began on January 4th. And, and as we can see, um, we've detailed this leading expanding diagonal pattern showing that it was a 53535 pattern uh, that traced out an expanding leading diagonal. We know that because wave four entered into the territory of wave one and diagonals allow for that overlap. It's never allowed in an impulse wave, but within the motive wave uh, context, on a leading basis, wave four can enter into wave one's territory. So it's a rare, uh, 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 rare uh, 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 type of pattern. Uh, it's not seen uh, frequently. In fact, Elliot himself never actually cataloged one. It took AJ Frost and Robert Prechter to identify this pattern and incorporate it into their text. Um, another interesting observation about this original or the the initial decline into the October low is that the fifth wave was somewhat truncated and truncation was something that Elliot wrote about in his original uh, work known as the wave principle uh, and um, what he discussed about the truncated fifth is that it falls short of its expected uh, target level because of a news event and what we, what um, our viewers might recall is that back on October 13th, uh, the morning of October 13th, we, we saw the CPI report was released and it was a much, much better uh, number than uh, most economists and analysts were expecting. And as a result, uh, we saw a sharp upside move in the S&P 500 off of its intraday uh, lows. And so that uh, information seems to have been uh, what catalyzed uh, the reversal and truncated that fifth wave. Now, the initial move up into the December 13th high was a clear five wave impulse pattern, uh, which we've labeled in lowercase um, uh, uh, Roman numerals and parentheses uh, to complete uh, capital A, uh, wave A of that ABC pattern. And then the subsequent um, wave B traced out a very clear flat pattern where it was three waves down to mark wave A, uh, three waves up to mark wave B, and then five waves down to mark wave C of B. To complete that flat uh, corrective waveform, uh, wave B terminating on March 13th. From the March 13th low, we traced out a very complicated uh, wave C. And the reason I say it's complicated is because it included a fifth wave extension, which also included a fifth wave extension or a fifth of a fifth wave extension as it's known. Uh, the initial um, uh, move up off of those uh, March 13th lows was a, um, a wave one at minor degree of trend. Then we saw a second wave pull back. We saw it trace out another five wave advance to end wave three at minor degree and then another flat corrective waveform to end wave four. But from that fourth wave low, we saw the fifth wave actually trace out a clear five wave move that brought us all the way up to um, the July 27th high. But the most interesting part about that is the final move up from um, uh, really the kind of June lows, which marked the um, uh, minute wave four, we saw it trace out in minuet, um, uh, at minuet degree of trend, another clear five waves to terminate at the July 27th high. Now, if our analysis of this is correct, that should end uh, wave C, and it should also end primary wave two, which is a corrective waveform of a five wave impulse decline that should end primary wave three down, uh, or should, should actually when end prime, uh, cycle wave A down when it's complete, but the next move to the downside will be primary wave three. Now, where are we since the July 27th high? Well, we've blown it up a little bit further. And what we wanna do is examine the S&P 500 at, at a 120 minute uh, range chart. So this looks back about three months 
And it gives us an opportunity to look at both minute degree and minuet degree of trend. Minute degree is uh, uh, illustrated in blue, minuet degree is illustrated in red. And so if we're basically just blowing up the same chart that we were showing you uh, in the prior frame, uh, so, so if we go back, we can take a look and we can see from about the uh, March 13th low and going forward, uh, I'm sorry, uh, from the uh, June low rather, uh, going forward, we can uh, basically uh, count five waves up and that final fifth wave advance subdividing into another fifth wave advance. So a fifth of a fifth to complete primary wave two. Now the initial decline also traced out five waves down at minuet degree. And we can clearly identify that as another leading diagonal uh, triangle and uh, that should have ended wave one down at minute degree of trend. Now, the advance that we saw in uh, early August that carried up to around 45, 25 or so, looks like it could have completed wave two at minute degree of trend. And from there, we have minuet uh, wave one down and minuet wave two up. However, we can't be sure until we see more information. But what we are sure of is that we've seen five waves down. So the direction of the trend has changed at minute degree. Now, what could possibly be the case and what we've illustrated at the bottom of the chart is our alternate count uh, for these last three bars. Um, instead of wave two up, that could potentially have been wave A of two. And instead of wave one down at minuet degree, that could have been wave B of a flat. And so we would be looking for um, any move above that, that um, minute wave two level uh, as, uh, as illustrated in the chart uh, to actually um, indicate that the alternate count is operative. And that would then complete wave two as a larger flat pattern. Um, so what we're really, we're really looking at here is the uh, minute wave two high and the minuet wave one low is kind of being the range uh, in which we will have a decision point, okay? A breakout or a move above that, that uh, minute wave two uh, would actually cause us to relabel the chart uh, and uh, cause that new high to be minute wave two. And it would indicate that the entire pattern traced out a flat as opposed to a zigzag. And then the next wave from there would be uh, minute wave three to the downside. So this is how we go through the analytical process of creating an alternate or, you know, um, the decision points that need to be made. So we've got a range right now. We're waiting for that range to resolve in one direction or the other. And we'll address uh, where we are within this count during the next episode, which will probably be in about three to five weeks from now. I'm not 100% sure when we'll go back and, and put together the next presentation, but we'll dig a little bit deeper into uh, the current price action and try and um, color it more specifically with Elliott's rules and guidelines and notation so that our viewers can get a better sense of what is driving these decisions. With that, I'd like to uh, just invite you all to uh, you know, take a look at uh, our website at jwhinvestment.com for more information, or you can follow us on Twitter at alpha underscore insights, or you can subscribe to our newsletter on Substack at hugeinsights.substack.com and get more familiar with our research from there. With that, I'd like to thank you all for watching today and uh, wish you the best of luck trading.